In this video, I'm going to go over all of the inverse trig and inverse trig derivative stuff that we did so far in this unit. Uh, so if I'm asking you to evaluate uh, the inverse sine of negative one half, this question is asking you what angle makes sine equal to negative one half. And there's a couple things you need to recognize here. Number one is that this function is only defined to exist between negative pi over two and pi over two. Right, that's the restricted range for inverse sine to ensure that it's still a function. So if I'm trying to sketch out a picture to get a reference angle, I'm either going to be in quadrant 1, because right, that would be pi over 2 up that way, or in quadrant 4, that would be negative pi over 2 that way. And if I'm thinking a little bit harder, my sine value needs to be negative, which means I should be somewhere in the fourth quadrant. So to figure out your reference angle right here, you need to ask yourself, what angle would make sine equal to just regular one half? And that should be from your chart or from the unit circle, but you gotta know that that's pi over six. So sine of pi over six would get me positive one half. However, since I'm in the fourth quadrant and sine is negative, I just went down pi over six instead of up. So the inverse sine of negative one half is just going to be negative pi over six. So sketching out a picture with my reference angle is always gonna help me. So I know what quadrant I'm in and so that I could reference my angle to use it to get what my actual angle is there. So for part B, I'm looking for arc cos or the inverse cos of negative rad three over two. Now, arc cosine has a different restricted range. It's going to go from zero all the way up to just pi, which means it's going to be in the first two quadrants. It could either be over here or over here. Because remember, halfway around the circle is pi. Again, remember cosine represents your x values. So if my cosine is negative, all of my positive x values are to the right, all of my negative x values are to the left. So I must be somewhere in the second quadrant here. So I'm just going to sketch some angle and I'll ask myself what the reference angle is. Again, if you know that the cosine of pi over six is rad three over two, that tells you that your reference angle is pi over six. But I don't measure my angle from the x-axis. I measure it from this part of the x-axis at zero degrees or zero radians. So you need to ask yourself, what would be that angle right there that would complete that? The answer to that is five pi over six. One way you could think about it is that if I go halfway around the circle, I should add up to six pi over six, or just pi, because that's 180 degrees. So if I already have one pi over six accounted for, I would need to add five pi over six to that to complete that half circle there. So that's one way you could figure out what your angle in the second quadrant would be. For something like part C, I know the tangent values are a little harder, but this is asking you what angle will make tangent equal to one. Now arctan again has a restricted range. It goes from negative pi over two, not including that, and up to pi over two. Again, remember it's undefined at those endpoints there. And if my tangent is positive, I must be somewhere in the first quadrant. And you could either go to your chart or use the unit circle to recognize that tangent is just sine over cosine, right? So if you're looking for when this equals one, that means that the sine and the cosine must be equal to each other. And that happens at pi over four, because remember on the unit circle, that's just rad two over two comma rad two over two. So if I divide those, I would just get one. And since I'm in the first quadrant, that's really all I need to think about. So the arctan of one is pi over four. This can get a little bit more complicated for, if we're dealing with the composition of functions here. Now. This is sine of the inverse cos of one half. And the inverse cosine of one half represents some angle. So really this question is, what is the sine of some angle? And if I could figure out what that angle is, it might be a little bit easier to think about this. So I'm gonna start with my innermost function, that inverse cos of one half. That's asking me what angle makes cosine equal to one half? Well, the answer to that is just pi over three. So this entire question is just asking me what is the sine of pi over three? If you want to draw the unit circle, you can. I think it's just helpful to memorize that that's going to be radical three over two. 
And again, you kind of see the coordinates of the unit circle right there, right? That's your x value, that's your y value. So just some things to look out for. Something that can be a little trickier to think about is that if I'm, I'm composing a function with its inverse, remember what happens there is that all I get is the input. If you don't believe me, you could always just ask yourself what angle makes tangent equal to radical 3, and then take the tangent of that angle, and you should get back to radical 3 as long as that's in your restricted uh, range. So just keep that in mind. For something like f, all the other instances we've done before, we've been able to answer the question just by looking at our chart or drawing the unit circle. But arc sine of 5 over 13 is asking me what angle makes sine of theta equal to 5 over 13. And the problem is that's not one of my special values, right? So I need to think a little bit harder here. Well, remember that sine is just the same thing as opposite over hypotenuse, if I interpret that as a ratio of sides. So if I sketch out a right triangle here, I could label my opposite side as 5 and my hypotenuse as 13. Now, I could do a little bit of algebra to solve for that third side there, right? This is just a Pythagorean theorem problem. Or if you recognize that this is a special right triangle, you could jump straight to the 5, 12, 13, so that adjacent side is 12. Because all this question is really asking for is tangent of this angle. Because arc sine of something represents some angle. That's what we have right there. Some angle has a sine of 5 over 13. What's the tangent of that some angle? Well, we have all the sides here. Remember, tangent's just opposite over adjacent. So in this case, my opposite side is just 5 and my adjacent side is 12. So in this case, the tangent of arc sine of 5 over 13 is 5 twelfths. So if it's a, not a special value that you don't know how to deal with, chances are sketching a right triangle and labeling the sides is going to be your best bet there. That's all for exact inverse trig values. But let's take a look at some of these derivative rules. I want to find the derivative of arc cosine of 2x. Well, this is a composition of functions. My outside function is arc cos of something. My inside function is 2x. Remember that if I were to take the derivative of just arc cosine, it looks something like this. Negative 1 over 1 minus x squared under the radical. That's if this was just arc cosine. But it's arc cosine of something other than just x. So you got to think about how the chain rule works here. I'm going to compose my derivative with my inside function. So rather than that being x squared, I'm going to make that 2x squared. And I just need to remember to multiply by the derivative of my inside function. And the derivative of 2x is just 2. Now sometimes we end up plugging something into this, so I like to simplify as much as I can. 2 is the same thing as 2 over 1. So if I multiply those numerators, 2 times negative 1 is just negative 2. And if I just clean up my denominator a little bit, if I square the 2, I get 4, and if I square the x, I get x squared. So that would be the derivative of arc cosine of 2x. I can think of the same logic uh, for the inverse tangent. If I take the derivative of something just, just regular arc tan, I know that looks something like this. And that's what I use to base what this derivative of arc tan of negative 4x should be. Instead of an x squared there, that's my something squared when I think about the chain rule. So that's going to be my negative 4x squared times the derivative of negative 4x, which in this case is just negative 4. A couple of things you need to think about here. This is not going to be, you know, where I change that to a minus and change that to a plus, because I would need to... Uh-oh. Hold on one sec. Like I was saying, this negative 4x squared, I need to deal with the squaring before I could deal with the addition and subtraction. So that's just going to simplify to negative 4 in the numerator plus over 1 plus negative 4 squared when I square a negative, a negative times a negative is positive, and that x squared is just going to be x squared. So that's what my derivative of arctan of negative 4x looks like. Now you might think part c looks a little bit different. But this is actually the same concept. It's just a constant times x. I could rewrite this as negative one-third times x, and all the same rules still apply. 
So again, just to remind you, if I take the derivative of arc sine of something, it's 1 minus something squared times the derivative of that something. In this case, that something is just negative 1 third x. Write that a little bit cleaner there. And the derivative of a constant times x is just whatever that constant is. So now when I go to simplify this, just be a little bit careful. I can put the one-third in the numerator if I want to, but this is already a fraction where I have a numerator and a denominator times a numerator and a denominator. So I can make the numerator negative one. I can bring the three in the denominator here because I'm just multiplying it to whatever that radical is. And I like to write it in the front uh, just by convention so it doesn't look like it's part of that radical. And one minus, again, when I square a negative one-third, I get a positive one-ninth times x squared. So you could write that as 1 9th x squared or x squared over 9. Again, the reason I like to clean these up is in case I need to plug something in later on. Now for part d, don't be scared by this constant out in front here. Think about if you were taking the derivative of 4 tangent of x, that doesn't change the way you would do that. That would just be 4 secant squared of x. You just keep multiplying by the constant. So the same rule is going to apply here, where if I differentiate, it's four times the derivative of arctan of something is one plus that something squared in the denominator times the derivative of that something. So that something is x squared. The derivative of x squared is 2x. Now, I've got all this good stuff in my numerator. So I can multiply those out if I want to to save myself a little bit of room here to get that to simplify to 8x in the numerator over 1 plus x squared squared is just x to the fourth. Now, if I'm dealing with a double composition of functions, you need to think a little bit more carefully. Here. Remember, you work from the outside in. So always ask yourself, what is the outermost function? In this case, the outermost function is cosine of something. And remember, the derivative of cosine of something is negative sine of something times the derivative of that something. So I'm going to multiply by whatever the derivative of arc sine of 3x is over here. And we already know how to do deal that, right? That's like just a regular composition of functions, a regular chain rule. So that derivative is just going to look like 1 over radical 1 minus 3x quantity squared times the derivative of 3x, which is just 3. So this is kind of ugly to look at right now, but there might be some simplification we could do here. There's a couple things I notice. The first thing is that I've got this composition of inverses here. So if I take the sine of arc sine of 3x, and there's a negative out in front, all this stuff right here is going to simplify to just negative 3x. So if I multiply that in my numerator times my 3 and my 1 there, I end up with a negative 9x in the numerator over 1 minus... 9x squared if I simplify just a little bit. Again, you don't have to right now. Technically, both of these are equivalent forms. But if I were to plug something in here to find like the slope of a tangent line, this form on the bottom here looks a lot easier to plug into than this form up here. So just keep that in mind. Speaking of which, if I want to find the slope of a tangent line to some function at a point, that's just telling me to take the derivative and plug in that point. So let's see what happens there. If I differentiate arctan, I should get 1 over 1 plus that something squared times the derivative of that something. And again, if you're having trouble seeing what that is, rewrite it as constant times x. So the derivative of 1 half x is just 1 half. Now I'm going to make my substitution, and this should be able to clean up pretty nicely. 1 over 1 plus... 2 rad 3 over 2 squared times 1 half. And the reason I didn't square this yet is because I noticed 2 over 2 is just going to reduce to 1. So this is really just asking me to square radical 3. And when I square radical 3, radical 3 times radical 3 is just 3. I don't know about you, but this is a lot easier to look at and simplify than how it was written before. 1 over 1 plus 3 is just 1 fourth times 1 half. I can multiply the numerators to get 1 and multiply the denominators to get 8 to find that 
the slope of my tangent line there is just 1 8. Now that's just part of writing the equation of a tangent line. These would be the medias to the problems I could throw at you. Where in order to write the equation, remember point slope form is going to be the easiest. Generally you're going to be given the x value of a particular point. You need to find the y value of the particular point by substituting that x value into your original function. And you need to find the slope of the tangent line at that point by substituting that x value into your derivative of your function. So really there's two things we need to do here. We're given an x value, so I need to plug that into my original function to get a y value, then plug it into my derivative to get a slope. So let's start with the y value. If I plug that in, do arc sine, it should be a special value I know how to deal with. So 2 times radical 2 over 4. Right now, that doesn't look like one of the special values for my chart, so I'm going to try to simplify that a little bit. Remember that 2 over 4 can just reduce to 1 over 2. So really, this is the same question as what is arc sine of rad 2 over 2? Now, that's a special value, so we could deal with that. I know that the angle that makes sine equal to rad 2 over 2 is pi over 4. So that's part of my battle down. I have found my y value of the point on my tangent line. I still need to find the slope though, and that's going to be a little bit more work. I'm going to take the derivative of arc sine of 2x. Now we've done a lot of these chain rules before, so I'll do this real fast. Should look something like that. And if I plug in rad 2 over 4, I should try to simplify this as much as I can to hopefully get an integer or just something nice enough to deal with. So let's see what happens. If I substitute that in, I have a 2 in the numerator over radical 1 minus 2 times rad 2 over 4 quantity squared. I'm going to keep simplifying here because the algebra for these is going to be the toughest part. Well, remember that just simplifies to radical 2 over 2. And if I'm squaring a fraction, I could just square the numerator. So radical 2 squared is just 2. And I could square the denominator. 2 squared is 4. Now, there's no reason to write it as 2 fourths. I could see that reduces pretty cleanly to 1 half. And if I'm trying to clean up this denominator as much as I can, this is 2 over radical 1 half. You could leave it like this if you want to. This is technically an equivalent slope. But I think I could do a little bit more here to help myself out. I generally don't like complex fractions. So I'm going to break that down into radical 1 over radical 2. The reason I do that is because I know what radical 1 is. The square root of 1 is just 1. And if I multiply, or if I'm dividing by a fraction, remember that's the same thing as multiplying by the reciprocal. So if I flip that second fraction to multiply, really I see that my slope here is just 2 radical 2. Again, to me that looks a lot cleaner than what we started with. So if I'm writing the equation of my tangent line, remember it's got to be in point slope form, I'm going to substitute in all those values. y minus my y value equals my slope times x minus my x value. So the y value we plugged in to find was just pi over 4. The slope we cleaned up pretty nicely to just be 2 radical 2. And my x value that they gave us was radical 2 over 4. So that would represent the equation of the line tangent to my original graph at radical 2 over 4. So that's the process for the equation of a tangent line. Let's just try one more example. Write the equation of the line tangent to f of x equals arc cosine of radical x at x equals 1 half. All right, well, I'm going to do the same thing where I'm going to start by making a substitution to find my y value. I'm going to take the arc cosine of radical 1 half. Again, this should dawn on you as something we don't know how to deal with. So I'm going to just make it radical 1 over radical 2. That's closer. Radical 1 is just 1. Now just as a side thought, if I try to get that radical 2 out of the denominator, if I don't like a radical in my denominator, I would just multiply by radical 2 over radical 2. Because in this denominator here, radical 2 times radical 2 is just 2. And in the numerator, I just get radical 2. Now I know how to deal with that. I might not know how to deal with 1 over radical 2, but that is equivalent to radical 2 over 2. So this is just asking me what angle makes cosine equal to radical 2 over 2. Well, I know that's in the first quadrant. I know that's just going to be pi over 4. 
So there's my y value. That's a pretty good start there. I'm going to continue by differentiating my function here. So if I differentiate, it should be 1 over negative in this case because it's our cosine, radical 1 minus my something squared, in this case my something is radical x, times the derivative of radical x, which is just 1 over 2 rad x. Now I know that just because I've memorized it over time, and I think it's in your best interest to do so as well, but just as you know, a side conversation, if I have radical x, that's the same thing as x to the 1 half, and if I differentiate that, I would bring down the exponent and subtract 1 from it. So I'd end up at 1 half x to the negative 1 half. Or if I rewrite it with that x to the 1 half in the denominator, to make it a positive exponent, it would look like that. Or if I rewrite it as a radical, it would look like that. So you could see there's a lot of mental steps you need to make here. So because we deal with this so often, it might be in your best interest just to memorize who that derivative looks like. All right, I'm going to start making my substitutions again. Everywhere I see an x, I'm going to substitute in 1 half. So negative 1 over radical 1 minus, be careful here, if I square a radical, those are inverses of one another. So that's just x right there, times 1 over 2, and I'm going to plug in 1 half there again for x. Again, th these are some pretty ugly complex fractions. I'm going to try to simplify this as much as I can, and you'll notice something very clean happens here. I still have a negative 1 in the numerator for my first fraction. 1 minus 1 half is just 1 half, so that's what's under my radical here. Multiplied by 1 over 2, radical 1 half. I'm actually going to rewrite this just a little bit to help myself out. I'm going to multiply the numerators. 1 times negative 1 is negative 1. And in the denominator, I have a 2. I have a radical 1 half times a radical 1 half. Well, would you look at this? Radical 1 half times radical 1 half is just one half because it's like squaring a radical it's going to pop that number out of a radical so in the denominator here it's just two times one half which is just one which simplifies this whole slope very nicely to just negative one again is this technically correct sure but you're going to have to simplify for a test just so that you have shown you have clear algebra skills so i have my slope I've got my y1 value, let's put this all together. My point slope form is y minus y1 equals my slope times x minus x1. So if I make that substitution, y minus my y value equals my slope times x minus the x value I plugged in there.